Welcome. Welcome to our show, Caring for Others and Caring for Ourselves, Healing Through the Arts. My name is Emily Kearns. I'm hosting today's show. I'm here on behalf of the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition. Every month we have a special show uh, featuring guests in certain areas. Today we are delighted to welcome two very, very special guests. We have Audrey Albert King, who's a dance movement therapist, and we have Barbara Bourgeois, who's an actress. And just in a moment, we'll start the show and we'll let you know a little bit about their lives and what it means for respite to use the expressive arts. So Audrey, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work, you know, who you are and the type of work you do and some of the current projects that you're working on. Okay, thanks Emily. Um, I'm a dance movement therapist and also a mental health clinician and I work with Alzheimer's patients and people with other dementias and I work um, mainly at memory care, I work in senior housing, I do memory cafes, and I run dance movement therapy groups and sessions. Um, and sometimes I work one-on-one -on -one with people and I facilitate groups. I'm also a mental health clinician and I have a practice two days a week in which I see um, many different populations in all different age ranges. Thank you. Barbara, how about you? Tell us a little bit about who you are and the kind of work you're doing and if you have any current projects underway. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah. Yes, um, I am a local actress. I've been working at my craft for some 35 years now. Um, I am currently uh, performing in a lovely little play called I Love You, I Love You, I Love You Too, written and directed by the very talented Alan O'Hare. In this play, I play a woman with Alzheimer's. Um, it's very near and dear to my heart. I have a sister who has Alzheimer's. Um, and I'm looking forward to performing this in many other locations. Great, Thank great. Thank you both. So let's drill down a little bit. Um, Audrey, could you paint a picture um, for the audience, for all of us, you know, what it's like to see you doing your work? If we were to walk in um, to a session where you're doing your dance movement therapy, what would we see? Um, you'd probably see a circle. Um, I like to start my groups in a circle. I like to actually do my whole group in a circle. I think it's important for everybody to see each other's faces. Um, I think it's important for me to see everybody's faces. It um, helps the group to feel like one cohesive unit. Mm -hmm. um, it helps me to see everybody individually. I think it's important for people to feel seen. I think it's important for people to f um, feel heard. Um, it also helps me to check in, sort of on a nonverbal level, to see how people are um, experiencing what we're doing, so that I can maybe alter what we're doing um, in some way that makes everybody feel comfortable. So you'll see everybody in a circle, you'll hear music, you'll hear a playlist. Um, every time I do a group, I have a pretty specific playlist. Um, so, for example, this week my playlist was about September. So um, every song actually had the word September in it. And um, every song is usually the same. You'll see ritualistic, um, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Usually you'll hear the, the same song every time we start. So the group is familiar with that song. It's usually a welcoming or a hello song. Sometimes it's a sort of go around the group and do a check-in. Um, I started this group this week with Earth, Wind, and Fire's September, so it's pretty rousing. Some a little bit surprising for some of the members, but you know, rhythm is very organizing and very cohesive, and sort of gets everybody on the same page at once. Mm. Um, so you would see maybe a clapping rhythm, and that's really great because maybe I'll see somebody's foot tapping over there, and then I'll be able to start tapping and see what somebody's doing, or somebody might be. Um, their foot might be going up and down, and then I'll be able to incorporate that. So how I run a group and how I like to run a group is I like to see what people are doing and try to adopt that into the group so that people are feeling seen and feeling validated. Um, when I feel like I'm a conductor or an orchestrator, I feel like the people are really coming up with the movement of the group, and I'm just 
facilitating it, and it's really there. I was going to say, it sounds to me like facilitation rather mm -hmm. than you're presenting to the group, which sounds really interesting. You're really tuning in to where people are at and how they're moving, and then you're playing off of that. So it's yeah. very, yeah. At least for the beginning, I mean, mm -hmm. I think with, I think with like Frank Sinatra, September, I mean, of course there's breathing and then there's the leaves falling and then there's really important part, you know, do you remember when the leaves turn color? What's your favorite color leaf? You know, somebody might say the sky is really blue when the leaves, and we'll talk about that. Mm. And, you know, there's props are really important. You might see scarves, and maybe that's about the wind. Lovely. And maybe the leaves mm. falling off the trees. And I think I had a really um, corny song in my September playlist. I think Neil Diamond, September morn, mm. something mm. like we swayed until the um, night became a brand new day. It was very romantic, and so the scarves were kind of hugging them and um, sort of lost in a big memory there. But we talk about what the movement brings up and um, had a lot of beautiful moments. Lovely. Mm -hmm. And of course, you'll see, uh, you'll hear, and you'll see a, a ritualized ending so that the group knows what's coming. When they hear that song, they know that the group is over and it's actually time for us to separate. Mm -hmm. I should tell the audience that um, I met Audrey when Audrey came up to a memory cafe in Andover and I was so struck <laughs> by the facilitation and uh, also the tuning in skill. There was one woman who was older who um, Audrey went over to and uh, she was having a hard time moving and Audrey actually, what I recall is that you took her arms and you moved with her and actually Audrey was dancing with her even though she stayed in her chair and uh, it was really, really powerful to see that attunement and facilitation, including, you know, you kind of waltzed with her in the chair, so really lovely work. Barbara, can you tell us a little bit about what it would look like if I were to see you perform? All right, I will, I will open the play for you. Great, thank you. Um, we have a very gifted musician, uh, vocalist, um, by the name of Mark Lippman, who plays guitar and sings. As the play opens, Mark is sitting on the side of the stage, playing and singing, Try to Remember. Mm -hmm. um, I come in, I walk in on the stage with the fellow who's playing my husband, again, a fine, fine actor by the name of Terry Blanchard. Terry is taking my hand and slowly walking me across the stage. I stop and I look at the audience and kind of wonder what is going on here and who are all these people. Mm -hmm. And he very gently, slowly takes me across the stage and gets me seated comfortably in my chair. And then the play starts from there. It's a very moving moment, I think. It's a very lovely play. Some, one of the audience members described it as heartbreakingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think that in, is indeed what this place says. Barbara, how did you um, get into this work? How did you find yourself doing this kind of work? You said in the beginning that your sister has Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. but how did you start acting and in general and then specifically acting here? Acting in general, yeah. I've been wanting to act since I was a little girl. Ah. It's always been in my blood, if you will. I've never done anything about it. I didn't until I was my mid-40s. But, um, so, and I've performed all over the area. But I met Alan about maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this particular play just really hit home with me because as I said, I do have a sister who has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of research and reading. Um, I remember reading a book and I can't recall the name of it now. This has been a while because I did, um, I played a similar character to this in another one of Alan's plays, so this is kind of a takeoff on that. Um, this a, was a book written by a, a couple, the husband of who had Alzheimer's. Mm. It's a beautifully written book. Uh, I did a lot of research, reading. I volunteered at nursing homes. And as I said, my sister now is in a nursing home. I've seen, I've seen the decline in her from when she first went into the nursing home knowing me, introducing me to everybody. I would take her out to lunch. She could order her own meals. To 
uh, not making, being able to make a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would order for her to just taking her for drives to the constant decline so that now she doesn't know who I am at all. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, this is uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart. So when Alan proposed this role in this play, I thought, absolutely, this is just, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been a joy and an honor to be part of this. Lovely, lovely, thank you. I've seen the play, I just have to say. <laughs> You've seen it? I did. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, I look forward to seeing it. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about later, you know, about yes. that later, how we can find out sure. where it's playing mm -hmm. and things. Audrey, how about yourself? How did you find yourself um, getting into uh, dance movement therapy? Um, what was your trajectory? Um, well, I've been a dancer all my life, and I went to school undergraduate and got a BA in dance, and then I went and got an undergrad, a graduate degree in dance education, mm -hmm. became a certified movement analyst. When I was getting my graduate degree in dance education, my mother said to me, why don't you check out dance movement therapy? <laughs> and I think just because she said it to me, it was just no. <laughs> and then, um, so I was a dance educator for the bulk of my career, working in the schools. And I had occasion to work with an art therapist and she mentioned it to me and talked about it a little bit more in depth. And um, I went to an open house at Lesley University on expressive arts therapies and mental health counseling. And the whole time they were talking about it, I was sitting in my seat going, oh my God, it's so ex exciting. Mom was right. I could really, <laughs> mom was right. I didn't really want to tell her that, but I did. Yeah. I, I ran to my car and I like put my family on speakerphone. I was like, I found my tribe. And I like exciting. enrolled right away. And um, I've been pretty much on a cloud ever since. I've been so happy. I wake up every day and I'm Lovely. really blessed to do what I do. Oh, it's great. It's great. Mm -hmm. So we've already talked about seeing one another's work and uh, the impact it's had on us. So let me ask you, you know, what is the impact you think you're having on caregivers? How do you know you're having impact? And then the second part of that is, you know, how have you been changed by your work? Um, go ahead. Why don't you start, Barbara? Um, if I may, I would like to give you a little history of the title of this play. Please. Where it came from. Yes. Yeah. Alan has worked a lot in different uh, uh, nursing homes mm -hmm. in, in the area and this he met this woman this was several years back she was probably in her late 80s at the time and she had Alzheimer's but she was verbal mm -hmm. she talked no problem one day suddenly she stopped talking mm -hmm. completely stopped talking she wouldn't say a word the doctors were amazed that he had no explanation she just didn't say anything and this went on for about three years after about three years, at this time she was probably in her early 90s, she walked up to the nurse's station one day, looked at the nurse, took her hand, and said, I love you, I love you, I love you too. And that was it. The nurse, the staff were amazed. They had no, couldn't explain this. Mm -hmm. She went on, met another person, and took her hand, said, I love you, I love you, I love you too. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't release the hand until that person acknowledged her in some way. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter what they said. She'd walk on, meet someone else. I love you, I love you, I love you too. So that is where the title of this play came from. Um, this is really a love story, this play. It's about this woman, myself, who has Alzheimer's and the fellow playing my, my spouse, my husband, who is also the caregiver. The play shows, I think, the struggles and the confusion, not only of my character, the Alzheimer's person, but also the struggles, the pain, the loss of the one playing the caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, my character she keeps confusing her husband with an old lover that she had many years ago. And she keeps calling him Buddy, the name of the other. She's confused and she gets agitated because her husband isn't responding the way she thinks he should. He, in turn, of course, gets irritated 
by this, and he becomes angry, very angry. He comes to realize that the only way he can hold on to this woman that he dearly loves, the only way he can communicate with her, if you will, is to become buddy. And you can really see the struggle. This Terry is a fine, fine actor. You can, you can see the internal struggle that he is having mm. to come over to her finally and say, I'm Buddy. I've come to take you to the dance. And I think, I think what the play does is give you an insight as to who these people are. I, I think when this woman who said, I love you, I love you, I love you too, she was expressing love. And I think that's what we can do for these people. We need to bring them love. I hope that's what I'm doing by performing this role, that I am showing them love, that I am honoring who they are that I am celebrating their life. Mm -hmm. I think it also helps the caregivers because they can see what is going on. They can, this is not, we can relate. They can see that someone else who is playing this role relates to what they go through. They're not alone. It's perfectly natural in a way, these outbursts, these angers, this, uh, it's, it's, it's perfectly expected almost that a caregiver would go through all this. Hmm. So I think in that way, it, uh, it gives a very important message. I think that's really um, interesting and I think it's one of the themes that's emerging that I'm hearing is that um, that you're both uh, meeting people where they're at, joining them in their presence and their present, um, and accompanying them for that time. You know, and also maybe I'm projecting, but it sounds like in the play you're giving the caregiver permission. You know, in the play the character has permission to become <laughs> this buddy, an ex-lover, yes. yes. which is quite profound. And I'm imagining that some caregivers, and I've been one myself for parents who had dementia, it's, um, I'm imagining that they hear or they feel permission to, to become who they need to become yes. so that they're present with their loved one. I mean, I think, you know, that's one of the things that I'm hearing the arts uh, is allowing, is creating the space for presence rather than trying to always reminisce about the past or be anxious about the future, but both of you it seems to me you're meeting people right where they are. Right, exactly. Um, so the second part is how have you been transformed, especially with your sister, or have you um, been impacted, I should say, not transformed. Yes, uh, impacted yes. Impacted by it. Um, mm. It has definitely helping me to understand my sister, where she's coming from, the, the decline that she's going through, um, and just helping me in general to more fully understand these people with, with memory loss and, mm -hmm. and dementia and so mm -hmm. forth, um, making me realize even more so than I already do that I need to bring them love. I need to express love to them and, and accept them for who they are and, and rejoice in them, celebrate them. And I think that's the second real important takeaway is the love and the kindness yes. that um, so often I, I've experienced that the, the folks are quite vulnerable and the caregivers also and don't, don't experience the kindness. Instead, they experience judgment and self-judgment too. So I think that's a tremendous gift. One of the audience yeah. members uh, commented that the play will change your mind and your attitude about how we see our loved ones in this situation. Lovely. Quite profound. Thank you. Audrey, how about you? How do you know you're having impact or what impact do you see on on others, participants, caregivers, families, and, and how have you been changed if you have or impacted by your work? Well, I think presence is a really good word because mm -hmm. when you are 
I guess dance movement therapy to me is an embodied kind of activity, mm. different from like physical games or something that um, you might see in memory care, but you are, um, well, hopefully, um, mind, body, spirit in the moment as a mover. So when, you, when a person can be engaged in that way, they are very present and in the moment. And I think when you're present and in the moment in a body, mind, spirit way, it's very difficult to be worried about who's picking you up, how am I gonna make supper? That's the word, not dinner, supper. <laughs> um, do I have a bed? Mm -hmm. um, where am I sleeping tonight? Um, all of these questions that you get constantly, they sort of dissipate. Mm -hmm. And I think when you can be in that moment, I think also some of the residents that I work with are closest to their real self. And that's why we can have a lot of moments of memory and reminiscing and this sort of on the edge of the seat involved movement, full bodied movement and fun. Um, and I think that's why sometimes I can step back as a facilitator because they're so in control of their person. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes they're not very in control of their whole person, mm -hmm. right? And you know, a lot of people who have Alzheimer's and other dementias lose language very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so being able to express through the body is so important. And you know, if, they're, if you're having trouble with anxiety or you're scared, you can use a lot of percussive movement and express what you're feeling. Um, so I think in that way, it allows for beautiful moments to happen. I call them like these goosebump moments, and I have them every day. Mm. So I'm so lucky and I feel honored and I get, these stories, and I know that this resident had this epic failure milking a cow, and I know this resident, you know, went from Canada to um, upstate New York in an Edsel riding in this seat on top of alcohol during prohibition, and I know so many of these stories, and I kind of feel like a charm bracelet in a way, like holding all these <laughs> people's stories that I might not get if I didn't do these groups. and. You said space, create space. I feel like I create safe space in that circle mm. in order to get to those stories. And I love having those stories. And that's where I have an impact on the caregiver in certain circumstances, because when they come, I get to say, oh, I had this moment with your mother today, or oh, I had this moment, and listen to this. And they sometimes are like, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, really? Or, you know, your mom was like this today and I put my hands on her face and I went like this and she opened her eyes and she said, oh, thank you, sweetheart. And she does not talk. Mm. So I'm so lucky. And I think that because I feel that way and I get to tell the caregiver that way and they walk away a little bit lighter mm -hmm. because they don't like know these things about their loved one. And then I feel like I get to bring my best self to work every day. Mm -hmm. So, lovely. And in memory cafes, where the caregiver is right along with their loved one, that's great because they don't have to care give. So I've had experience where a, a couple, a man who cares for his wife, got up and they were able to do a, a slow dance together. And that was he, at our cafe. I have to interrupt and say <laughs> the a daughter and her husband uh, did a slow dance behind her mom who was dancing with Audrey. And I thought to myself, when was the last time they were able to spontaneously and so moved in that present, you know, hold each other in such romantic, it's probably happened elsewhere, but this well, yeah, happened in Andover I, and it was yeah. powerful. I was so thinking powerful. it had also happened in Waltham and uh, to um, that Samore. You know, when the moon, beautiful. and we had people being stars and people being the moon. And it was great. It was beautiful. Lovely. So in that, mm. that respect, it's really nice for a caregiver to just mm. have these moments. And I was thinking what you just said is almost ironic, isn't it? That, that, um, that you say folks can control their true selves and express their true selves when, when they let go through the movement. I think that's a really interesting twist and paradoxical that when we lose our memories and our control over our data and our information, which identifies us in our culture,
we can actually have more control over our authentic self. I mean, that's in a way what you're saying you're seeing and facilitating. Yeah, I mean, so it depends on where in the brain yeah. you're being, you know, right. affected. Right. But when you are embodied and in the moment, you're, you're free. Lovely. You can be free. Yeah. So now I'd like us to um, move a little bit to the magical moment. We're already touching upon it, but I know, um, Audrey, you have brought some photos. Um, and if you want to uh, talk a little bit about maybe a particular magical moment um, that you've experienced, and again, we've started touching upon them, but if you can choose one and really bring us into that um, real fully and maybe nod to some of the photos that the audience will be able to see, that would be great. And then, Barbara, we'll hear from you, too, some of the most magical moments, one or two, that you've experienced. Um. Well, the one on this slide, um, we're doing some scarf dancing, and my focus is um, on this woman that I'm dancing with. Um, I'm engaging with her pretty present, and uh, I, it's an interesting photo because uh, everybody's sort of engaged with their own prop. Mm in their own way, the scarf in their own way. Some are interacting with each other, some are sort of um, throwing their scarf our way. Um, and the, the woman who I'm moving with um, hasn't really um, been participating lately, but has been getting up to, um, to waltz with me um, and slow dance with me and hadn't been in a long time. Mm. And we had just done um, sort of this, well, this waltz, and um, she wanted to cha-cha. And um, <laughs> because she kept saying, you know, moving her feet like she wanted to cha-cha. And I don't have that much experience with this sort of partner's <laughs> dancing like my parents. So I was just trying to follow her feet. And I wasn't doing that good of a job. So she just sort of, and we don't speak the same language. I have a translator. And so she just started saying, cha-cha-cha, cha-cha-cha, cha-cha. <laughs> she was actually being empathetic toward me. Mm. She wanted me to be able to do it, whereas I'm always trying to facilitate it. And I was like, oh. And when I got it, she was moving around the room. She was in her own space. and. Um, giving out the scarves was a way, one of a transition that our relationship had been so solidified and I needed to get back to the group. Mm -hmm. Giving out the scarves was one way that I could get back to the group and still have her and sort of transition out of, you know, getting back to the group. But my attention was still very much um, focused on attuning to what she was needing to sort of break free from the group but it was just a nice moment. Lovely. When the, she was taking care of me. <laughs> <laughs> For both of you, tremendous yeah. impact. Yeah. The mutuality, yeah. I think, is really important. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to another picture in a second, but Barbara, go ahead. Uh, if you could speak actually, about a magic. this has to do with the dance as well. Yeah. At the end of the play, uh, my husband, my spouse, who is now Betty, comes over to me, hands me a rose, and says, hello, Marion. I'm Buddy. I've come to take you to the dance. And we get up and we dance, and we're dancing for a while. And I look up at him, and I say, now I remember you. Now is she remembering that he's Buddy, or is she remembering that he is Edmund, her current husband? I guess that's for the audience to decide. I, as an actress, and being in the role, I know what my, my feeling is. But when she says, now I remember you, and she looks up at him and says, I love you. He in turn says, I love you, mm -hmm. and I love you too, hence the title of the play. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was extremely touching. I can almost feel it now. Just, it, was, it, it was powerful. It was a powerful, powerful mm -hmm. moment. And I can imagine that that's what someone in that role as a, a caregiver mm. would feel. Mm. You know? So 
to me, to me, for me as an actress, that was very magical. Lovely, thank you. And one of the things that um, we didn't talk about in preparation for the show, but it's coming now, is that you know, in light of um, you know us focusing on respite, respite meaning a short break for both the caregiver and, and you know for the relationship and for the family system. I'm hearing how it's a break, a break from the stress, but also a break from the pattern of thinking and feeling, right? This remembering is a remembering on many levels, right? To get to your point, you say the body, spirit, and how did you say it? The three? Body, mind, spirit. Body, mind, spirit, mm -hmm. but a remembering of all of that mm -hmm. as a whole. And I think that's the respite piece that we're talking about is for the individual as well as the caregiver. Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? or? Um, you know, because why well, talk about the arts and respite, but I'm hearing that it is actually a respite, a restorative moment, right? Right, um, right exactly. It's, it's what I'm taking away from mm -hmm. the remembering yes. and the connection and how it impacted you, and then how you had to return to the group, but you were so moved. Yeah. Yeah, that happens frequently. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's another picture. Would you mind sharing another magical moment? Oh, so that's from, um, yep. the Memory Cafe from um, Jewish Families and Children's Services in Waltham. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, caregivers, and they bring their loved ones. And it's uh, a place where they come and uh, have a snack and some socializing. And then there's a main activity, which is usually a creative and artistic activity. And um, people um, usually go, same people sometimes usually go every month, so they're getting familiar, which I didn't know getting sort of to see each other every month, which in a way is a respite for people to be able to see the same people every month so caregivers can kind of talk to caregivers and mm -hmm. even you know people who are suffering um, get to talk to people who are suffering. So I uh, facilitated that month, I facilitated the dance movement therapy group and it was um, great great fun I had um, beautiful moments with people I had uh, one moment when I was uh, I believe Tennessee waltz I had that toward the end and I was dancing with uh, various people and one woman was in sitting and um, some people stand most people sit and I try to make sure I get to every single person. And I have to get to every single person personally. And so I held her hands and was just swaying with her. And she's pretty nonverbal. But looking in her eyes, she just sang the entire song to me. So um, I was sort of looking around to everybody else to see what they thought if I needed to sort of break free and attend to everybody. But then there was certainly a lot of people, there was a lot of staff there that mm. were, you know, it was okay. So I just, they were even, they, the other people in the Memory Cafe were even encouraging me, oh look, she's singing, stay with her. So we just, we just swayed and looked into each other's eyes and sang the entire Tennessee Waltz and it was really lovely. So. That is lovely, the sense of community sounds like that's created through the activity and I would also say I don't know when I go to theater particularly moving theater there's a sense of oneness even though it's an individual experience mm. it's shared so which I think exactly. is really powerful piece of uh, you know the the present moment it's not only individual but it's a shared moment really really great so we're we're toward the end of the uh, program today but I'd like us to um, discuss a little bit about what suggestions you have for others who are interested in participating in this type of creative work, participating either um, following in your footsteps, becoming an actor or actress, or, um, or uh, and or a dance movement therapist. What suggestions would you have for someone who wants to facilitate be on that end of things? And also a suggestion or two that you may have for someone who wants to, uh, you know, be on the other side, more uh, experiencing your facilitation. What are some of your thoughts about how people can become involved in um, the arts as respite? Well, as far as acting, of course, that has to be a, a, an individual desire and, and some some talent. <laughs> um, On the other end of it, I think I would really encourage anyone and everyone to, 
to see the, the play. I think it has a wonderful message. It's a very short, 30, 40 minute play. Um, and the message is, is just, it's beautiful. We've had a lot of audience uh, responses. Uh, it's deeply moving. Uh, I think I, I mentioned uh, heartbreakingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to just to, to see as many or take, take part in as many of these type of activities, whether it's, the, I think the dance movement is absolutely wonderful. Mm. Uh, this play itself, I think, has a strong message. Uh, we are, are looking forward to taking it to as many uh, facilities as possible. Uh, Alan said to tell you he would travel anywhere with it, <laughs> uh, as will I. Um, I think it has a very loving, strong message and I encourage anyone to take part in any way they can. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's, it's um, interesting and, and fun even if you don't prefer to get up on the stage and act. To act. There are all other sorts of background uh, positions. So you could get involved just uh, being a stagehand. Even that is exciting. Interesting. So, to be part of sure. the Yeah, absolutely. And I've done, theater. As well as acting, I've done I mean, I've produced, I've not directed, but I've produced, I've stage managed, I've done just about every other aspect of the theater. So any, any kind of involvement is, is well worth it. Lovely, thank you. And um, at the end of this program, we'll have contact information if people want to find out um, where they can see the play, or how they can get in touch with you and or Alan, mm -hmm. right? We'll have that scrolling. So great, thank you. Audrey, how about you? What are your suggestions and recommendations? Wow. Well, <laughs> um, part of one of the groups I um, facilitate was also a pilot study, and they did find that um, dance movement therapy was one of the number one activities that really um, helped um, stave off sundowning, and um, caregivers reported that, um, you know, their loved ones were in a much better mood for a long period of time after dance movement therapy. So. I think it's a it's a great field and it's just gonna um, keep expanding. You uh, there are uh, I think eight universities that you can become certified as a uh, um, a dance movement therapist right when you come out of the program. So you can go to um, American Dance Therapy website adta.org and you'll have all that information. Mm -hmm. But you know if you're interested in working with this population um, and something a creative arts therapy or dance movement therapy you can shadow maybe a dance movement therapist at a site and see what it's all about um, that might be one way you can go to open house at a university they also have alternate route way of getting um, credentialed so you can check all that out at the ADTA website um, you can attend a memory cafe um, and you have all that information on your website um, I facilitate groups, I contract out, um, I do memory cafes, I do trainings for people who um, are interested, so you can get a hold of all that Right, we'll also, at the end, also have information so you know how to reach Audrey if you want further information there. And again, as Audrey said, on the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition's website, we'll have both of your um, you know, uh, contacts uh, information, and we'll also have a link to this show. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up? Anything that we didn't touch upon that you are thinking about or? I think one other way that people can get involved in anything like this is to volunteer. Volunteer mm -hmm. at nursing homes and facilities. Um, Great. In fact, when I first started research, I went to the nursing home and asked if they had any reading material mm -hmm. because I thought it might be an imposition for me to, you know, I offered to volunteer and they said, why don't you volunteer? Great. And I loved it. So Great. That, that's an excellent way for people to get involved. Also the walk is coming up, the, the walk is coming up at yeah. the end of September. Yeah, up in um, the Andover area, the Alzheimer's walk is um, Sunday, September 18th. You can go on Alzheimer's Association's website, um, we can also put that on our website and you can see where there's a walk in your area very important thank you for that in terms of research and uh, 
and also other events. Good. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us and thank the audience also for tuning in and for exploring respite through the arts. Uh, join us for the next show, which will be uh, discussing uh, spirituality and respite. And we'll have two great guests who uh, look at the world of uh, the spirit, uh, religion, ritual, and how we can experience respite um, through that. So thank you again, and uh, see you next thank month. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.